One of the clearest images that came out during the COVID-19 crisis was of these long lines of people waiting for food for hours um, outside food banks. And it was really reminiscent of the, the Great Depression. I was working at a drive through food bank and we started at 10 o'clock in the morning. The first car that was in line had gotten in line at 4.30 in the morning. This was for a box of food worth $60. And these lines snaked through the streets into the next city over for this one food bank. Now, no one is doing that unless they have to do that. The COVID-19 pandemic created an extraordinary need for food relief to keep millions of Americans from going hungry. In 2020, food banks throughout the nation served an astonishing 6 billion meals to needy Americans as the pandemic exposed the extreme economic vulnerability that so many people face. During that year, there was a 55% increase in the number of people who required getting into food lines to feed their families. And one in four Americans had to either skip meals or required food assistance to make ends meet. We saw how COVID-19 disproportionately impacted working class communities and communities of color, not just from a health perspective, but from an economic perspective as well. And when you have that level of instability, we're reminded that we have a lot of work to do. The truth is that that beautiful side of America is supported by an ugly underbelly. And that has been there all along. COVID opened the window and, and it forced us to peer in and see this underbelly and the ways that so many are really just barely surviving the Federal Reserve Board does a survey on a regular basis where they ask people, would you be able to cover a $400 emergency expense? And a surprising number of families say, no, they would not. It really does illustrate just how precarious a situation very, very many people are in in this economy. If you have a vehicle and, and, and you're using it to get to work and then you catch a flat tire, that $35 to $45 for a used tire, not even a brand new one for a used tire, can mean no eating. I might only be able to eat dinner, not breakfast and lunch. Or my kid might have to go without something. What, what is crucial to understand is if you're working 40 hours a week and you work 50 weeks a year, that's 2,000 hours. Not very complicated. If you earn $10 an hour, 2,000 hours, that's $20,000. You're halfway to the poverty level. The main problem in the United States is low wages. Wages today should be on the order of $25, $30 an hour, not even $15 an hour. In the midst of the pandemic, we have a tale of two cities. Corporations and the corporate elite have profited from the pandemic and are making billions and billions more in profits than a year ago. At the same time, the so-called essential workers who are putting their lives at risk every day on the jobs have watched a stagnation and decline in their standard of living. Uh, we have watched the rise of the homeless population. Which have, we have watched the rise of the uh, working poor who, in spite of working 40, 50, 60 hours a week, can never emerge from poverty. The curtain was pulled back during the pandemic where you start to see what people have to endure. And so we, we stand in awe, uh, or we ought to anyway, at what the poor have to carry rather than in judgment at how they carry it because they just simply have to uh, carry more than most people. The working men and women of this country truly are the backbone. and. It's time for people to understand that they're not being greedy when they want a meager raise, when they want good health care for their family, when they, got, they, they want to live in dignity when they hang up their tools. We need to get behind these people. This is the country that was based on work hard and uh, you have the same opportunity as everybody else. You know, now that we see that's, that's bullshit, not everybody has that opportunity. When my parents were starting out on one income, on one job, you could buy a house, you could pay for your groceries, you could send your kids to school. So now we go to present and the two incomes, 
working good jobs, working hard, people still can't pay their bills. I mean, what, what a shame is that? It's just, it shouldn't be happening in the greatest country in the world. My biggest frustration is that the workforce, many of, of, of those that are actually building uh, the infrastructure, believe that it's okay, that that's the way it's supposed to be, that they're a sacrificial lamb. People don't speak up enough. People don't stand up for themselves. Dan Langford, Pete Rodriguez, and Frank Hawk lead the Southwest region of the Carpenters Union. Their efforts to keep the construction industry essential during the pandemic allowed the 60,000 carpenters in their union to stay on the job. Construction workers, grocery clerks, nurses, and other essential workers were hailed as heroes for keeping America moving during the crisis. It's interesting, I, I, I think during the time of the pandemic when you had essential workers, where suddenly you were actually seeing the person who was leaving their home to bag your groceries, you were seeing this person in a way that you probably never even acknowledged this person's existence before. I never had so much respect for watching that 18 year old kid pushing in some carts into a grocery store when I didn't know where I was gonna get toilet paper. And they're out there in this crowded store and they could have sat back and they could have got those big unemployment benefits, but they came in there and they kept them stores open for us. The unfortunate reality is that during the pandemic, we have only seen economic inequality get worse. And for the essential workers who have been on the front lines, who have been our healthcare workers, who have provided food, who have been picking and planting the fruits and vegetables that we eat for those that have been working in the warehouses and the supermarkets. They are called essential workers, and in reality, they are expendable workers. We cannot in good conscience call certain workers essential in the middle of a pandemic and then forget about them as soon as the pandemic's over and not treat them with the dignity and the justice that they deserve. All of a sudden, we have a new word that's cropped into our vocabulary, essential workers. And who's an essential worker? A grocery store clerk is an essential worker. There's not somebody there to sell you the food. You can't get the food. And that's always been true. But our society has gone from being about 70, 80% production workers to about 70, 80% service workers. The, the service economy is far and away most of our economy. And we tend to pay service workers very low. Even before the pandemic, these low wage jobs actually cost Americans billions and billions of dollars in survival public assistance for workers who were not paid properly by their employer. These are not people who have chosen not to work. These folks are working multiple jobs and still needing to get food stamps, needing to go to public uh, health facilities because they have no choice. That is the kind of money we were already spending pre-pandemic because employers didn't want to pay their workers a livable wage. There is a common misconception in the United States that the only people who rely on government assistance programs, like food stamps, are the chronically unemployed. In fact, one in three Americans receiving food assistance worked every month that they were provided support. And seven million working adults live below the poverty line. The annual cost for taxpayers to provide assistance for the working poor is $107 billion. Seeing people work hard, do what they're supposed to do, they follow the rules, they go to work every single day, they work 40, 50, 60 hours a week and still can't afford basic necessities like groceries, and they can't afford health care, and they can't, uh, they can't afford to put gas in their vehicle. And you got multiple families living together. And I mean, it's, it's a, that's a violation of the American dream. For many working class people, the American dream can be achieved through membership in a union. The leadership for the Carpenters Union have made it their life mission to represent workers in the construction industry. However, it might surprise some people that they often help workers who are not in their union. ¿Cuántos eran? No, pues ayer éramos como unos, yo creo unos más de 50. 50 carpinteros. No, con todo el mundo de, del frame. Carpintero, labor, framer. I spent 15, 16 years knocking on doors and, and doing house calls. 
These were non-union workers that had been cheated their wages. Uh, these are uh, guys that were having to work for a labor broker or a coyote or whatever the case may be. So I heard their stories for 15, 16 years. Spent a lot of uh, dinners at, at folks' home versus my own home, listening to the story and assisting in the documentation to protect their rights or to be able to submit paperwork to the labor commissioner. Union or non-union, that, that individual deserves to make a living and to provide for their family. I obviously believe that the way to do that best is being a union member. The construction industry is an example of a bifurcated industry, where on the one hand, you have workers who are represented by organized labor, who by and large are making a middle-class living. And on the other hand, you have another set of workers who are not represented by labor, who are struggling. You've got two people. One's union, one's non-union. They both wake up in the morning and they make their lunch box and they get ready to go to work. They both have to take a little bit of ibuprofen uh, to make sure that the aches and pains go away and they're gonna go off and do their job. They both have to pay the exact same amount of, uh, for gas. They both have to uh, pay rent and provide for their families. But the difference between the two is one is gonna be paid uh, a livable wage. It's gonna have health care. It's gonna have the benefits and the other one is gonna be paid just enough to get by. I have three children. The first two children uh, were born before I had my union job. I had to go to the county for assistance to pay for those, uh, those births because we didn't have any healthcare insurance. My last child that was born, my son, I had union healthcare and we paid $10 for him. It was $5 for my wife's first visit and $5 for prenatal vitamins. So uh, what I do is go out and try to change other people's lives like my life has been changed. I don't think anybody can argue with uh, what we're doing is the right thing. The representation that the Carpenters Union provides allows its members to earn a middle-class income. But for many millions of working Americans, their paychecks don't provide enough money to meet basic essentials, such as food and rent. It wasn't always this way. 50 years ago, the largest corporation in the country and in the world was General Motors. Because of the United Auto Workers that represented their members, if you worked for General Motors, you had a middle-class existence. You had a decent wage, you could buy your home, you could send your kids to college, and at the end of your career, you could retire because you had a pension. Today, the largest corporation in the world is Walmart. They refuse to pay their workers a living wage, and they uh, refuse to pay them health benefits. You can be working at Walmart to the day you die and not have a pension, uh, not have a sustainable life. As a consequence, they instruct their workers on how to obtain government assistance, including healthcare benefits because they refuse to do so themselves. They know exactly what they're doing. Uh, the irony is that although they are taking advantage of government assisting uh, the poor, uh, they are using their profits to attack the role of big government. There are multiple service sectors right now coming out of the pandemic that are experiencing the worst labor crisis that they've ever experienced. And there's a debate going on. Is it because people are sitting home lazy, collecting unemployment insurance, they don't wanna go back to work? Or is it that workers are saying, we're done. We're not gonna go back without livable wages. It costs me more in transportation to get to work than I earn at work per hour. It's not worth it for me to go to work anymore. How could our nation possibly recover from that? So the government, instead of saying, let's put together a jobs plan and a plan that's going to have good wages, we'll, keep, we'll spoon feed you a, a stimulus check. And people don't want a stimulus check. You take the stimulus check and shove it up your ass. They want a job. They want a career. That's that pride that, that has made the American middle class the, the model for the world that's slipping away from us. There's been offshoring of industrial jobs and automation so that the jobs you can get are low-paid service jobs and they're not steady jobs. And people are feeling uh, 
disappointed, they're feeling confused, and they're feeling ashamed. And that's what I think has led to a kind of increasing proportion of Americans who are in this downward fall, some in free fall. And so you see diseases of despair, opiates, and, and alcoholism, and suicide. The scripture scholar Marcus Borg says that the principal suffering of the poor throughout history and throughout scripture is shame and disgrace. People feel like somehow they haven't measured up, they haven't accomplished what they ought to. It's not just about the poor don't have enough money, but that there's a sense of that they are less than. Father Greg Boyle is a Catholic priest who founded Homeboy Industries, the world's largest gang intervention program. Throughout his career, Father Boyle has helped over 15,000 gang members pursue a better life. Gang violence has always been about a lethal absence of hope. So, you know, the, the solution in large part is not to, to be tough on crime, but to infuse hope to communities where hope is foreign. So you want to be able to somehow get people to uh, conjure up an image of what tomorrow might look like, you know, to imagine something different for themselves. You have a lot of kids that grow up and they look up to Spider-Man and uh, Superman, or they, they inspire to want to be a firefighter or, or a doctor. Um, I didn't have those dreams. Those dreams weren't real to me. I couldn't touch those people. If I go outside my house when I grew up, it was the neighborhood drug dealers, and they were treated as heroes. When the ice cream truck came down, they were able to buy everybody something off the ice cream truck. So that's what, what pings into your mind. That's what you want to be. I want to be able to provide for the community in that way. And how do I provide for the community that way? Do exactly what they did. Anthony Fagan was born into a world where he believed joining a gang and selling drugs were his only options in life. Ultimately, he was convicted of a felony and spent six years in prison. So when I first came home, I got a job in a warehouse. I worked about six days a week. I made about 725 bucks, and I was working 12-hour shifts. I would show up and work, and I would work very, very hard at what I was doing, and um, I wasn't able to save anything to put myself in a better situation. So it was frustrating for me to, to, to sit in that and spend the amount of time that I was spending and only make that amount of money when I know what I could go attain if I go back to my old lifestyle. The terrible conditions associated with inner cities can create a disproportionate focus on urban communities when considering the plight of the poor. However, economic suffering is widespread, and when examining distressed areas, a direct line can be drawn from big city housing projects to rural trailer parks. I talked to a guy who said, I'm a poor hillbilly. Um, I don't know anything, um, and um, I don't have a job. My parents wouldn't let me out of the trailer because my uncle was dealing drugs uh, in, in the back. There had been a murder three trailers down. There were days we didn't have enough to eat. And he said, what's the difference between me and some person in um, the middle of Detroit you know, for our families, for uh, our joblessness, for uh, our misery. He said, the only difference I can see is uh, the music. The economic struggles that so many people are facing in our nation is contrary to the ideals of the American dream. For millions of Americans, that dream is slipping away as the wage gap between the top and the bottom of the labor force continues to widen. In the 1960s, the typical CEO earned 20 to 30 times more than the average worker at his company. Today, CEOs make over 300 times more than their workers. In the 1960s, a CEO would have been embarrassed to be making the kind of money that a Jeff Bezos is making or an Elon Musk is making relative to the workers in their firm. Something has shifted in our social norms where we value and celebrate greed and excess as a sign of success and contribution rather than a sign of taking more than your fair share. 
I don't begrudge or deprive anyone of making a lot of money. I totally support that. I think it's great. But I also feel that you shouldn't have to work three jobs or a full-time and a part-time job in order to support yourself and your family. We can absolutely afford to pay decent wages to workers in this country. And one way to think about it is to look at productivity growth. Over the last 50 years, productivity in our economy has more than doubled. If the minimum wage had simply kept up with productivity growth over the last half century, it would be roughly $22 right now. When those folks, when regular people, low-income people, middle-income people have extra money to spend, they get to go out to eat. They get to buy an extra pair of shoes for their kids. They get to do things that injects more money into the economy. They'll actually increase their spending when they get a bigger paycheck. Unlike you get a bigger paycheck to somebody who already has everything that they need, they're less likely to, to buy more as a result of that. And that's, that's not so good for the economy. More than 70% of our total GDP is consumption. It's not investment, it's not government spending, it's consumption. If people can't consume the goods, if they don't have the money to buy things, then the economy collapses. It requires a decent level of salary for everyone to be able to consume at levels enough to keep the American economy going. Creating widespread prosperity was one of the greatest achievements of the post-World War II American economy. But starting in the 1970s, each decade has ended with fewer adults living in middle-income households than there were at the start of that decade. During this downward slide, Millions of union manufacturing jobs were either shipped overseas or replaced by automation. Today, a large percentage of working class Americans only have low paying service jobs available to them. That's a big problem with long term consequences. These jobs don't pay a living wage and have led to the erosion of the middle class. Low wages are not a function of just some tiny sliver of the economy only affecting some people who are lazy and need to just do better for themselves and get out of those jobs. In fact, the lowest wage sectors in the United States are the largest and fastest growing. They are retail and restaurants. And together, they comprise anywhere from a fourth to a third of all U.S. jobs. We look at the poor as like this second class, like something was, was their fault. Yet they're working just as hard as the, the hedge fund manager, maybe even harder. The people that got deemed essential was not the white collar. We wanted somebody that was going to stock those shelves at the grocery store. We wanted somebody that was going to keep our places clean. We wanted that nurse to get to work. You needed people to pick up your garbage cans in front of your house. That was what was essential. One big difference between working class people who are doing okay and making it and those who aren't is whether they're in a union. They have higher pay, they have better benefits, they have better working conditions. If they're mistreated, they have representation on the job. There's just a whole host of things that come along with being in a union that means you're much less likely to be really struggling and facing an economic catastrophe. For too many people, facing an economic catastrophe can often start a vicious downward spiral that lands them on the street. When we're building projects, whether it's the single family home or the high rise hotel, we might be building somebody's second or third home, their vacation home or something like that. And right across the tracks, you got people that are looking for a cardboard box to live in. And it makes you disappointed in America that we've come to this. When I started working in homeless services 15 years ago, we saw this in our largest municipal areas. And actually, for the longest time, it was a battle between LA and New York on who's the homeless capital of the nation any given year. And what we've seen over the last, I'd say five, six years, is this explosion of homelessness in medium-sized cities. Being homeless and being on the street um, was, in my mind the worst thing that could possibly ever happen to me you know uh, the first night you sleep on the, the concrete is uh I, I can't even describe the worst feeling i've ever felt in my whole life looking for something to put my stuff in to carry it around because i have entirely too much 
you know? And all of a sudden I'm a shopping cart lady. I cried all night. <laughs> I couldn't stop. All I could think of was what happens now? <laughs> what do I do now? There are over half a million homeless people in the United States. The closure of many mental institutions in the 1980s contributed to the increase of this population. Although mental health issues play a significant role, the greatest causes of homelessness are the lack of affordable housing, unemployment, and low pay. A tremendous amount of people do not make enough every month to have any bit of savings. And they are literally just putting it together between rent, car payment, childcare, insurance, and some food. Uh, I think that is a lot of us. I always used to be the one to say, I could never be homeless. I would never let that happen. I'll work two jobs at McDonald's if I have to, you know. The reality is you could work two full-time jobs at McDonald's and still not be able to afford to live on your own. The cost of rents and deposits and moving into places. And, you know, I crashed my car, I lost my job, you know, and then I couldn't pay for the room anymore. And I'm like, what am I going to do now? I knew somebody who was homeless who stayed in the alley. And I thought, well, I'll try to stay there. Every day I would wake up and be like, something's got to happen today. This can't be my life. This can't be where I'm going to wind up. This can't, this can't be how it's going to be. The economic vulnerability that millions of working Americans face was illuminated during the pandemic. This was especially true for communities of color. The numbers don't lie. Communities of color, Latinos, African-Americans, Native Americans uh, were disproportionately devastated by COVID. The very community I grew up in, Pacoima, California, was uh, labeled for a stretch there as the epicenter of the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic. Because you have you know, higher concentration of essential workers, uh, out there risking their, their health and that of their families because they come home to maybe more dense and crowded living conditions, you know, with underlying health issues because of a disproportionate lack of access to health care prior to the pandemic. I mean, that is a bad formula really coming together. It's difficult to convey just how severe poverty is in the United States until we see severe poverty in the United States and realize that it is a real barrier uh, to well-being. And when COVID came, communities of color were already very weakened by poor infrastructure, poor access to care, those kinds of things. If you were to take a map of the state of California and put red dots in the areas that uh, have unhealthy air, you know, what does that map look like? You, know, you take another map and start putting red dots on areas of California where type 2 diabetes is uh, much higher. And when you take another map and you look at, uh, you know, put red dots in the areas where schools are underfunded and therefore underperforming. You know, you took another map and you put red dots on uh, where income levels are lower and poverty rates are higher, you start to pick up a pattern. It's the same communities that are suffering from all these different policy issues. And it's not a coincidence. In Los Angeles, Latino communities are among those who suffer the most from the health risks that come with living in negative economic conditions. In late 2020, when LA County experienced a large spike in COVID cases, Latinos made up the majority of cases. Latinos accounted for 55% of all COVID deaths in California during the pandemic. In fact, in December of 2020, death rates among Latinos jumped an astonishing 1,000%. In industries where Latinos comprise a significant portion of the workforce, it was especially challenging to keep those essential workers healthy. One of the remarkable things that happened during the COVID crisis was that construction continued, particularly unionized construction, because unions insisted on a kind of safety at the workplace that made workers feel comfortable coming to work and reduced the chance of somebody catching the disease at work it revealed in this instance the difference between unionized work in the construction industry and non-unionized, far riskier work that might be in construction, might often involve day labor. I want to make sure I'm taking care of myself 
and I'm sure you're doing the same. So again, man, the key word is stay work and stay essential and stay healthy, all right? The number one thing was to make sure that our members were healthy and that if, God forbid, something were to happen and the husband or wife come home and they, they've got some sort of symptom, they have health care that they're gonna be able to fall back on. The difference between the union and the non-union worker is the union worker had health care for themselves and had health care for the family. Pete Rodriguez was raised in a union home. His father and uncle were both union concrete workers, which allowed them to raise their families after immigrating to the United States from Mexico. My dad came to this country as a young man. Uh, he obviously had to take a huge risk uh, to come here. I believe he came alone. Uh, and then um, as, as uh, uh, things progressed, he sent for the family and so forth, one at a time. Although Pete grew up in a union construction family, it was not his original plan to follow in their footsteps. But when Pete couldn't find a decent job and was forced to live at home, his father stepped in with a plan. I was hit and miss with the jobs that I was working at. Um, I wasn't working in construction, and he basically comes in one day and he says, "Hey, you know, you uh, you tried it your way. Now you're gonna now you're gonna do it mine." So we get in the car, we take off, and I go, "Hey, pa." I says, uh, where are we going? He goes, we're gonna go to the Carpenters. You're gonna be, you're gonna be in the apprenticeship with the Carpenters Union. I was a kid that uh, I really didn't have any direction. I, there wasn't anything in my life, you know, like most kids, uh, hey, I'm gonna be a fireman, I'm gonna be a policeman, I'm gonna be a professional football player. I just grew up and really didn't have anything that uh, struck me as, hey, this is your life work. I got into construction because I needed a job. It wasn't what I was looking for. There was a construction job and I got into it. I wasn't even looking to become a union member. The guy hired me and said, oh, by the way, this is a, a union job. Although Dan Langford and Pete Rodriguez were fortunate enough to land good paying union jobs, these jobs are getting much harder to find. Union membership has continuously declined for the last 50 years and it has reached the lowest level since the Great Depression. Economists say this decline has contributed to the growing income inequality in our country and compare the current state of the economy to the time right before World War II. It's important to understand that inequality in the United States right now is at a peak that we haven't seen since the Gilded Age or the period right before the Great Depression. The share of income going to the top 1% is higher than it's been at almost any other time in U.S. history. The extreme poverty that so many endured during the Great Depression was caused by the wealth gap between the rich and the poor. Conditions were so bad that people took to the streets. Something had to change. What we witnessed in the 1930s was a massive surge in organizing. So we saw the sit-down strikes. We saw massive unemployment marches and demonstrations. We saw people throughout the country demanding change, and uh, especially at the workplace. As a consequence, the uh, Roosevelt administration responded and took steps. The people of America have no quarrel with business. They insist only that the power of concentrated wealth shall not be abused. President Franklin Roosevelt's response to the Great Depression included many strategies, such as financial reform and the implementation of a social security system to provide a safety net for needy Americans. But the most important thing that Roosevelt did to restore dignity and unity was putting America back to work. There were several different ways in which that, that occurred. There was the creation of the Work Progress Administration, which literally gave hundreds of thousands of jobs to build highways, roads. There was the um, Civilian Conservation Corps, which helped build park systems. There was arts initiatives and other types of programs that were really there to give all these people who had very little hope new avenues and new mechanisms to work. As our nation learned during the pandemic, Americans are far too susceptible to financial ruin. And the status quo is clearly not stable for our nation's economy. Many leaders have looked to the success of Roosevelt's New Deal 
as inspiration for an infrastructure-based strategy to help solve the issues of homelessness and income inequality. I'm sure there was a discussion or debate on can we afford to invest in our nation's infrastructure, but that didn't stop us from doing it. And in fact, it was those very investments in our nation's infrastructure and putting people to work that we credit with the economic recovery that we had. And that's what we have a chance to see again uh, if we are smart about rebounding from the COVID-19 pandemic. If you're starting to rebuild the entire electric grid, that's gonna create lots of jobs. If you're gonna build thousands of windmills, that's gonna create lots of jobs. 60% of our, our bridges and overpasses are in danger of collapsing. If you rebuild the highway system, that's gonna create jobs. So we need to be creating the jobs and paying them enough salary so that people can really live a decent life. These are jobs that can last years and years, and it provides the income for the individuals, good quality income for the individuals that are doing it, but improves everybody's quality of life. When you build a new road or a new highway or a new bridge, it's gonna improve the quality of life for everybody as a result of that infrastructure being constructed. And that's what we need to invest in in this, in this country. So it also gives us the opportunity to address the housing crisis. We can use that money to build low income, affordable housing, workforce housing, and, and market rate housing. The only way for us to stop homelessness or to stop the pipeline into homelessness is housing. And it's all types of housing too. There isn't just one answer. It's permanent supportive housing. It's affordable housing. It's market rate housing. It's all of it because supply and demand, it's very simple. President Roosevelt's infrastructure strategy has provided current policymakers with a blueprint to stimulate our economy. However, the other half of Roosevelt's plan ensured that jobs being created would pay a fair wage. This component of the New Deal was a law called the Wagner Act, also known as the National Labor Relations Act. It guaranteed the rights of workers to organize into unions, engage in collective bargaining, and it gave them the power to strike. The United States has a long tradition of hostility towards labor organizing and unions. And that was one of the things that made the Wagner Act so substantial because it was really the federal government saying that people have a right to be in unions and that unions are a really important mechanism of collective action and of economic security. Part of what the Labor Relations Act did was for the first time try to get some parity, some equivalence of power between the people who are working for a living and the people who own the factory. I think the shift in power as a reality of, of a day-to-day -day experience for a worker only comes when their workplace is organized. The power of the strike is the major leverage of workers in a workplace. So how do you convince an employer that you deserve a higher wage? Well, you say, I'm not gonna work for less. And so if the employer can replace you with another um, worker, then you're gonna lose. The New Deal and the passage of the National Labor Relations Act had a huge impact in improving the livelihood and the living standards for millions and millions of people throughout the country, a fully one in three worker uh, was a member of a union, and it brought to birth the modern middle class. From the end of World War II until the 1970s, union membership in the United States thrived, with a third of all workers in a union. Organization of the working class created an era that many economists called the shared growth period, as workers were given the opportunity to participate in the growth of the economy. Essentially, when you looked at the distribution of income and of wages, folks at the sort of 90th percentile of the income distribution, their income was going up about the same as folks in the middle and as the same as people on the bottom. And corporations had a sort of ethos of shared prosperity. That is that they recognized that they needed to return some of what they were earning to the workers who made it possible for those firms to make such money. Now, of course, that was reinforced by union power, which helped to establish those social norms that prosperity need to be shared. The combination of the new rights afforded by the New Deal to the labor movement, coupled with the economic recovery that occurred during the New Deal and the World War II, really afforded 
the idea that if you were a working class person, you could have a middle class lifestyle. My dad got in the trade in 1962 and starting wage was $1.11 an hour. When he turned journeyman in 1965, he was making $5 an hour and he married my mom. She was a, a, a bookkeeper and an office manager and she was making $65 a week. So the two of them make $265 per week. They bought their first house with $700 down payment and their house payment was $55 a month. So they made five times their house payment in one week. It took them three weeks to come up with a down payment. And today that just can't happen. If you worked, you could buy a house. If you worked, you could afford a car. And if you worked, you could make sure that there was food on the table for your children. And we've lost that. What's well, often called the magic 30 from 1945, 1975 roughly, uh, the middle class grew, the distribution of income became less unequal, the gap between rich and poor narrowed a bit, and you had basically what workers are able to produce and the dollar value, what they can produce, and wages moving about together. And then in the mid 70s, major change. Productivity keeps going, even accelerates, and wages flatten. In the three decades after World War II, wages increased by 91%, which roughly matched the 97% growth in productivity for the same era. However, from 1975 to 2015, hourly wages only rose 9%, as compared to the 74% growth in productivity during those four decades. This stagnation in wages caused the average working class family to make $18,000 a year less than they would have earned if their wage increases stayed consistent with productivity growth. Why did it happen? There was an oil crisis in the mid 70s that was part of it. You had major technological change in terms of the way the, we produce goods. You had globalization in terms of many factories beginning to substantially move abroad. And a major consequence, you had the breaking of the unions and the unions were basically dissolved, so there was nobody there to fight for the workers to get their increase in, in wages. In the 1950s and 60s, where unions were very strong, we saw that uh, the uh, standard of living of working people was on the rise. Uh, from the 70s forward, with the decline in union, den in union density, we saw the opposite occur, and a, a growing divide between uh, the rich and poor in this country. We've gone from having about 35-40% of our labor force unionized, which then set the wages for most of the rest of the economy, to, in the private sector, less than 7% of the, of the labor force is unionized. The labor market has continued to transition from unionized manufacturing jobs to non-union service jobs. Many experts point to this shift to explain the reduction of wages for the American working class. It is not the nature of the work itself. Manufacturing jobs of the last century, once thought of as dirty, bad jobs, became good jobs because of unionization. Tells me that any of these jobs, from a janitorial position, to a retail position, to a restaurant worker position, can be seen as a good job and that we can value these people for their work. The only thing that blocks us from doing that is our political perspective. I think a myth that's worth busting here is this idea that, ah, the decline of unionization has just been a natural thing that's happened. Workers don't really want unions anymore. That is not true. The share of workers, of non-union workers who say yes to that question, they would vote for a union, is actually higher now than it was 40 years ago. Whenever a company is facing a union drive, they'll, as a matter of course, hire a union avoidance consultant or a union busting consultant to come in and give them the, the playbook. For example, the psychologically oriented union avoidance firms will show employers who to hire. And they, they show them how to hire by giving them a, a test that workers take that uh, shows them whether or not they're likely to be pro-union. The legal ones will show them which laws they can break and have very small fines to pay and no union, and it's, it's worth it for them. Being a union leader isn't easy. There's a lot of money behind businesses and corporations to combat a union organizing drive 
or to combat uh, a union effort to represent workers. The powers to be want to keep people unorganized and keep them broke enough that they're desperate. It's been a constant fight. And it's, you know, you, you, you let your guard down for a second and you'll get knocked back two steps. Felipe, you grab a couple guys, you guys go in first. We'll have the second group of guys go in first. If somebody's got any questions, you say, man, go talk to, go go talk to Pete. He's standing right there. One of the actions that Carpenters Union leaders take as part of their organizing efforts is visiting non-union construction sites to check safety conditions and to ensure that non-union workers are not being exploited. When visiting one of these non-union sites, Pete Rodriguez spoke to a worker and learned that the contractor was utilizing unfair wage practices. They told us they're getting paid by the piece. The one guy told us that they had to share their checks and so forth. We walked into the superintendent's uh, meeting. They were having a job site meeting. Uh, he went around the table. I actually sat down and uh, had a conversation with him. When I brought him up to speed with what we discovered upstairs, he got excited and asked us to get off his job. Started getting angry and irate. And then as we were leaving, uh, on the left-hand side, one of the one of their guys put their hand on one of our guys, and they start dropping f bombs and so forth. One thing for sure, we're not going to be bullied and we're not going to be intimidated by a contractor, nonetheless a criminal contractor, regardless of what uh, of what they think. They might be the king of their castle here. Not today. Not today. We're going to call the labor commissioner and we're going to make sure that everybody understands that there's workers that are being taken advantage on this job site. During the pandemic, as millions of Americans were losing their jobs and facing extreme financial hardship, the stock market was booming. As the stock market went up, Journalists reported that the nation's economy was strong, but that wasn't the reality for much of the working class. The stock market and how well the stock market is doing is basically irrelevant to the vast majority of households in this country. So just to put a couple of stats on it, roughly half of households in this country own zero stock, even including stock held indirectly in retirement accounts. Zero. And then a bunch of households who do own stock still only hold, a, only hold a little bit. All that just points to, for the vast majority of people, the stock market just doesn't really matter. The trend of focusing on the stock market to measure the health of the economy started in the 1970s, at the same time that union membership declined and income inequality expanded. During this time, it became very popular amongst business leaders to cite the philosophies of the economist Milton Friedman, who argued that a corporation's only responsibility is to its shareholders and none whatsoever to its workers. Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago and a whole core of people basically argued that corporations should not, as a moral statement and as an economic statement, should not worry about the well-being of their workers. One of the problems with that is that policymakers really clung on to that, thinking, all right, the way to actually make the economy better off to help this country is to actually prioritize corporate profits over everything else. Their loyalty is to the shareholders. Their loyalty is to maximize profit at any cost. And that cost could be polluting the earth. It could be destroying communities. It could be laying off thousands, even when they're making record profits. And the best measure of whether they can maximize profits was the value of their stock. So give all your CEOs a bunch of stock as part of their pay. So the CEO himself would have a vested interest in increasing the profits and increasing the value of the stock. And the workers, that's their own problem. That's not, the, that's not what corporations should do. In my opinion, anybody who's only sold out to shareholders have never owned a company themselves. They've never watched the face of an associate when you pay their health insurance. They've never seen the face of an associate when you hand them even the smallest of bonus checks, the acknowledgement of the effort. If you don't care about your associates, if you don't care about the people, you don't deserve success. 
You just don't. We know that if we work in a business and it treats everybody better, more fairly, those workers are more productive, that company is more successful. Note that the only major airline in the United States that has not gone bankrupt is Southwest, a unionized airline that treats its workers right because they realize that that's their main asset to being able to be successful. I would argue in this moment, uh, the corporations are failing their shareholders. They're acting against shareholder interests by paying workers as little as they're paying. And I'll give you the perfect example in the restaurant industry. In February 2021, when the National Restaurant Association, which represents the chains, Denny's, Cheesecake Factory, IHOP, was telling Congress, there's no way you should raise this wage. If you make us pay more than $2, we'll go out of business. Restaurants will fail. You know, we'll fail our shareholders. You can't do this to us. In that same moment, Denny's CFO was exposed for having on a shareholder call t telling shareholders that in fact, paying $15 and a full minimum wage with tips on top in California had resulted in their company growing faster in California than any other state in the US because consumer spending was higher in California than anywhere else. Chain restaurants are notorious for paying their servers low wages, many of whom are women. In fact, as wages have flattened over the last decades, women have suffered the most, especially single mothers. When the wages were stagnating and prices were going up and they're trying to sell more and more goods, the first thing that happened is the women went to work. And so the labor force participation rate, that is women being either working or looking for work, moved from around 30% to about 60, 65%. So the proportion of women between 16 and 65 who worked doubled. Okay, so that, that cushioned it. You all of a sudden had two wage families. A single woman raising kids was in trouble because she only had one salary and the entire economy was geared to two salaries. On top of that, what we have is women just making less. We know that women who are doing the same job in the same industry, in the same place, with the same education, the same experience, so sort of controlling for all those possible things that are affecting wages, women still make less on the job. We still have these big gender disparities. And so a single mom is really hit twice on that front, makes less money as a woman, and then also doesn't have a partner to depend on to, to be that dual earner. It's difficult when you're a parent, especially a single parent, and you've got a couple of kids and you're working for minimum wage and you gotta put them in daycare. I mean, now you're talking a couple hundred dollars a week for daycare, you're basically working for nothing. We have to do more to make sure that in our schools, in our communities, there is a uh, childcare option available for kids so that they know that their children will be taken care of. They don't have to worry when they go off to work. So talk about how single moms are especially vulnerable. Um, it's hard to not get personal on that one. Let's, just, just give me a moment, if you don't mind. As a single mom, every system is built against you. We can work full time and be kicking ass at work and we're still paid less. Childcare is a real problem that nobody, nobody really talks about. There's this idea of like, well, you'll figure it out, but the majority of single moms aren't making as much as they have to put towards childcare. I mean, even for me, childcare is more than my mortgage. I would say out of the many populations that we see as a society, it is one of the most hanging by thin wire populations there are out there for all the reasons. We've had numerous single moms that have joined our union and some of them in the most difficult times, trying to make ends meet, trying to feed their families. And when they join this union, they made the same amount as the men, and that's the way it should be. I mean, it's total crap that women get paid less for doing the same job. One of the most positive things about our union is that women get equal pay. Income inequality is a complicated problem. One factor that cannot be ignored is race and its impact on generational wealth. In 2021, the net worth of the average white family is nearly 10 times higher than that of the average black family. For the working class, net worth is mostly driven by wages, and wage disparities between black and white workers 
are compounded by the high rate of incarceration among African-American men. My dad went to federal prison when I was maybe six months old. Uh, I was sentenced to 25 to life. So um, I have a visiting room and, and telephone relationship with my father for the first 15 years of my life. The rate of incarceration amongst black men has at times reached staggering proportions and has contributed to the wage gap between black and white workers. Going to prison has a lifelong impact on an individual's ability to make a living. Felons face tremendous challenges getting hired, and the ones who do can expect to make 52% less after getting out of prison. We need to recognize the impacts of an era of over-incarceration, and so workers who are returning from the so-called criminal justice system, it's really an incarceration system, who have a mark on their record that makes it difficult for them to secure employment. And so this is one reason why I'm firmly convinced that the next generation set of issues for civil rights leaders, racial justice leaders, is economic justice. Race plays a huge role in income inequality. We know that there are echoes of structural racism that are very much at play in our economy today, in our labor market today. We know that black workers are less likely to get hired, more likely to get fired. So those kinds of forces are, are really still at play in our economy, making, you know, creating a still very large black-white wage gap, black-white income gap. You know, we can't talk about this kind of structure without talking about things like racial capitalism and historical racism and the ways in which what we see today in terms of racial and ethnic minorities in urban communities that are essentially um, empty in terms of a lot of resources, um, it's almost the natural evolution of what we would expect to see from disinvestment over literally many generations. We know that due to things like occupational segregation, discrimination, other labor market disparities related to structural racism, black and brown workers are more likely to be in low wage jobs or middle wage jobs. So things that lift up the lower end of the wage distribution will actually disproportionately help black and brown workers and reduce racial wage gaps. So that's things like increasing the minimum wage, boosting other labor standards to promote worker protections and rights, increasing unionization, all of those kinds of things will actually disproportionately help black and brown workers. The challenges of addressing the racial wealth gap have to start with job quality. You have to rebuild the kind of economy that is able to produce good jobs with retirement benefits for people who are not only college educated, but also for people who choose a different path. We don't have a, a, a welding class. We don't have a wood class. We don't have an auto mechanic class in South Los Angeles. And I think that's the mentality that needs to change. Studies show that construction tradesmen and women make that decision, want to be in that craft or that trade by seventh or eighth grade. And so I think that's where Apprenticeship programs should go on a full court press, no holds barred, at guidance counselors in middle school. Vocational training has disappeared from our schools, but some labor unions have focused their recruiting efforts on educating young people about career opportunities in their industry. It's our union's mission to put people to work. So we reach out to workers every day and we especially reach out to minority communities and try to give them the opportunities that others might not. I worked in a warehouse. It was a non-union job. And I experienced the journey of the broke. And then I found out about the trades and that they would accept you with a criminal background. I joined the Carpenters Union and I went through the four-year apprenticeship program. Each class taught me something different, whether it was basic framing, whether it was drywall, whether it was uh, taping, um, whether it was wood framing, 
uh, building stairs, all the different things that go into our course curriculum, welding. I was able to obtain all these skills through the apprenticeship, and then I was able to go out and actually use those skills on my job site. We're extremely proud of our apprenticeship program. You come in and uh, you start out with uh, about $18 an hour wages. You got all the benefits, vacation pay, medical coverage, annuity. So uh, from the day that you walk in, you start building towards your future. It gives you a chance to learn a new trade. It gives you a chance to provide uh, for yourself or for your family. Uh, and it gives you a chance to um, excel in, in a career. I've been at this a long time and I'm starting to see something I've never seen before. I get phone calls from mothers that are proud that their son or daughter is a union apprentice. They got this glow about them that they're saying that, you know, my child's gonna have healthcare and pension because pensions almost, unless you work for the government or you're in a union, they're non-existent. I take responsibility and ownership for everything that I've done, the good, the bad, the negative. But I changed because I started to see all the things that I was gonna be able to do for my family. This career has been phenomenal to me. It was the, the catalyst that broke the generation curse that I have been traveling for so long. So my kids were born with insurance. When they go to the doctor, I have an insurance plan for them. It's no um, public assistance or county or anything like that. I work every day and I plan to my insurance plan and they're able, able to benefit from that. Um, I didn't have that growing up. Um, not bitter about it. I'm just, I'm just grateful that I was able to break a, a curse that had been traveling along in my family for so long. Anthony Fagan took advantage of the great opportunity that the Carpenters Union provided him and has become a superintendent in just under five years. Anthony's hard-earned career has allowed him to provide a good life for his family and break a generational curse of poverty. But that's not everyone's story. In many parts of the country, there is a growing despair for many Americans that they will never have it as good as previous generations. Union jobs are getting hard to find and have been replaced with poverty level wages in service and retail work. Dignity of a paycheck is a hugely important to people's sense of pride and uh, feeling uh, good about themselves. And uh, when they work hard and still can't pay the bills, it's demoralizing. They feel ashamed, even though it's not their fault. I think they have an ideal in their mind when they think of where they are. They think of the American dream. They think of doing better than their dads did. And they think of how far away from that dream they are. We forget that work doesn't just provide us income, but it also provides us meaning. And when you feel like your traditional America is slipping away on you, that's a sort of uh, fertile ground for demagogues, and that's what Trump tapped into. We have made America proud again. We have made America safe again. And we will make America great again. Donald Trump and his advisors were very astute in recognizing the sense of alienation and hardship that many white working class Americans felt and used a variety of different promises to appeal to this constituency where many people were fe feeling e extreme economic hardship. One of the great ironies of the Trump presidency is that you have a billionaire who was purporting to represent the working class in this country. The reality is, is that many Americans were actually losing ground during the Trump years. We saw income growth stagnate or decline in a majority of states during the Trump years prior to COVID. Trump did not perform miracles for the working class. He did perform miracles for those with the most resources. He was right when he said over and over that the economy is rigged but he had no interest in solving it. In fact, the policies that Trump put forward 
doubled down on the rigged economy over and over and over again. He could have made choices that put workers first, for example, and instead over and over again, he made choices that prioritized the interests of corporate executives and their shareholders. Take a look at your stocks. We're very close to breaking the record and NASDAQ has already done it. You know, NASDAQ has broken the record, I think 16 times already. While President Trump was focused on the stock market, millions of working Americans face the worst economic hardship of their lives. Economic vulnerability increased during Trump's presidency as the gap separating the highest and lowest income brackets grew annually by 9%. And 20% of American children now live in poverty. Ironically, even as times grew worse for blue collar workers under Trump, the white working class continues to be his most ardent supporters. But I think people felt seen. I've been doing research now in Appalachia, which is coal country, and the coal jobs have left devastation behind. And one guy who had been a coal miner, he lost that job. He went to watch Donald Trump and he said, when Donald Trump promised to bring coal jobs back, I didn't believe him. I knew he was lying, but I still felt he saw me. Last year, after the November 2020 election, we were holding a protest in Albany, the state capital, on the same day the MAGA crew was out there protesting against the electors, submitting votes for Biden instead of Trump. So we were both out there with our protest. They finished theirs, and then they came over and asked us, what were we protesting for? We said we were protesting for a raise in the minimum wage for restaurant workers. And they said, oh, we believe in that. And they joined us. They joined us. And to me, it is that is the epitome of both what is wrong and what is right. What is wrong is that not only did President Trump seek to divide Americans by race, by believing that actually the enemy is among us, that we are each other's enemy, that was problematic. But I gotta say the other side was problematic too. The Democrats, who, don't seem, who didn't seem to understand that raising wages and doing things that would benefit all workers, that that would actually be popular among all workers, that's a problem too. Really since the 1970s, the Democratic Party has shifted its platform and policies in many ways, and especially in how it's sort of producing economic growth with things like with tech, um, globalization and free trade. And this has really led to a certain kind of alienation from many members of the white working class who felt like the Democratic Party no longer was speaking to their their interests or their needs. And it really created an opening for someone like President Trump to come in and make many members of the white working class feel like someone was actually listening to them and was going to address their, their really profound and real economic hardship. We went generation after generation where the typical lifestyle, life cycle, if you will, would be you went to work in a factory, you earned a, a good working wage, equivalent to $30, $40 an hour today. You earned enough to buy a house, your employer provided health care, your employer provided a, a guaranteed pension, and that's gone. That's simply disappeared because it was management in the corporation who made the decision to move out of the country or to replace the worker with a machine. But you needed a scapegoat, so they refocused the anger. And, you know, and President Trump was a perfect example of this. It's, it's the Mexican immigrants or it's the black workers. They'll point a figure at somebody else to divert the attention from the, what, what really is causing it. We belong to each other and that's, that's an undergirding truth that we forget. This is sort of how, why I think we haven't made much progress because it's so the lines are so drawn, us and them, and when we're really meant to erase the lines, not redraw them. We've got to stop with allowing us to be divided by race and gender, and let's hate the gays, or let's hate the blacks, or the that Mexican immigrant. Damn it, we're in America, and when you start identifying them, that to me tells you you hate America. 
I'm not sure what it takes to overcome this. We got to bring the country back together. We got to bring the middle class out, back together and find that magic. And the only way I see it happening is organizing in unions. History teaches us that the only reason why certain jobs entered the middle class is through organizing, is because unions came together, demanded that those jobs be paid a decent wage and uh, decent benefits. The desire for unionization is really high, but actual unionization rates are really low. And the difference between those two things is due to policy. Policymakers haven't adjusted to rebalance the playing field. And that has been a key thing that's, a, that's led to a decline of unionization. Well, I think it's important for policymakers to remember that not all jobs are created equal. Uh, you know, if you have a, a low paying minimum wage job that uh, somebody who's working 40 hours a week and is still dependent on public assistance to support a family, that's not a good paying job. The more we can recognize that and have that translate that into our policies, expanding uh, opportunities for everybody to participate in the economy and be contributors, uh, I think that's uh, uh, when we're strongest as a nation. And we know it's the labor movement that built the middle class in America. When someone joins the union, it is an opportunity to break any negative stigma that you have on yourself because of what you can accomplish. Once you join a union, the sky's the limit. I feel like a superhero to my family. I feel, I feel very grateful that we're not living pay, paycheck to paycheck. I feel extremely proud of that. There's a bunch of underdogs out there that have been told that they're not gonna amount to anything. And so, uh, they're proving everybody wrong. And that's that's a pretty good feeling. It's a pretty good feeling to see uh, a young man or a young woman walk into the hall with their family. It gives you goosebumps. I've seen hundreds, if not thousands, of young men and women that came into a union hall just looking for an opportunity and uh, getting that opportunity and what it's meant for them in their lifetime. And these are members that when they came here, they may not have had a uh, legal status to work here and they've worked to become citizens and now they're putting their kids through college and they're graduating through from college. You see them on Facebook and they have a child that's just graduated from Berkeley or Stanford or USC or UCLA. What, what better story is there in the country than to see someone that came from nothing, that sacrificed their whole life so their kids could have the opportunity that they didn't have. I mean, that's that's truly what America's about. We as working people, we're never gonna be rich. We're never gonna have that yacht. We're never gonna have the big giant house on the hill, but we can be happy and we can keep the wolf away from the door. And hopefully our kids will have a better life than maybe we did. Which one of our members' child is gonna be the one that got to go to school and cures cancer? Or you know, maybe it's the next president of the United States. That's something that is real possible. And I think if we do that, that's when we make America great again.